so there's there's basically three types of people when it comes to retirement. So mm -hmm. there's us who's accumulating and growing our net worth. Mm -hmm. There's people in what I call the hump phase where you haven't retired yet, but like you're not taking your foot off the gas. And mm -hmm. then there's the people that are decumulating their assets, which is retirement. Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor? Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it? Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Experimentation. Today I have a gentleman that we're just gonna flow into it because that's the kind of energy that I get. And, but, you know, I want to give a huge shout out to my, my guy, Nick Hutchison. Uh, you know, Nick was here on the podcast. I got to pull it up now because we are at 260 plus episodes and I don't have all my episodes memorized, but I just know that we were just talking about this off air, the iron sharpens iron. And Chris, you know, when we met, I think I'm sure most people are probably saying this because your your energy, your charisma is just it's contagious. And I remember meeting with my wife. I'm like, we were there in person on site in good old um Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio. And after you left, we we're just like, Wow, <laughs> this guy has energy. Like good energy. And I think I have energy. You got really yeah. good, good energy, contagious energy. And you come from a place of service, but you're also, you're scratching your own itch. And one of the things we were talking about, right? And I want to just make sure I show this right here because you're also the author of Capitalize Your Finances. You're also a podcaster as well. I got mm -hmm. this hand, uh, this book in my hand a little while ago, and I'm still tapping into it because one of the things we appreciate here in experiment nation is, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So we want to make sure we cover all pillars. And I'm so glad that today I get to have you in our lab, right. As wealth management company, owner, founder, financial planner, mm -hmm. uh, financial advisor. Right. I mean, all the above, but at, at, again, it's just you, you bring yes. you to the table and yes. how you, how you, you what you are what I believe a representation of what your business is. That's why I always like to have the good people come in first because you said it before we were offline. It's hard to find someone who doesn't have their you know stuff in order that yes. doesn't completely translate to how their business has success. So without further ado, Chris, welcome to the lab, brother. How's it going? Dude, there there is no place I would rather be. Like I said, you are the the last thing on my plate today. And uh best for last well second best for last because then i get to go home spend time with my one-year-old baby girl my amazing mm. wife that's a quick save I um, know. I was so, like... yeah but you get a <laughs> like... firm second place firm second place. <laughs> a firm i so, feel good man i feel like i feel like i'm family already right because i mean you are family. you know you said well and you said wife your listeners, and, and, and kids listeners need to know that we have the same birthday yeah no that's so listen Guys, I, I don't take my birthday very lightly because it's a very, very special day. And like I remember we were talking last summer, like, hold on. Did you just say the uh -huh. 31st? Not the 31st. Mm -hmm. May 31st, That's a good day, man. Yeah, the world, the uh the day the world changed for the better, according to my mom. Wow. Yeah. So I remember you and I were talking actually, and we've been talking for a good hot 20 minutes. I'm like, listen, we better turn the turn turn this record button on because we're just, we're dropping the gems already. And <laughs> one of the things you told me, I remember this on our, on, on our chat last time is a lot of people seek for that financial literacy. And one thing that stuck out with me is you're like, you more or less grew up with it. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, and that was like, well, okay, I haven't met too many people. Like, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs I hang out with is like first generation. You know, I hang out with a lot of immigrants too. Like their parents came here, whether it was from, you know, different country or, you know, whether overseas or the country next door. And there's a little bit of that grit too, right? And there's there's a lot of things that, you know, we were taught that was maybe traditionally taught and we're kind of rewiring and, Re, 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 reinventing ourselves in a way 
But yes. so I always find it fascinating when I'm like, man, like you were doing, you told me about stocks. So like what, what, what was the first age you were doing that? So 10, 10 was the 10. age that I bought my first two stocks. And, you know, I, so yes, I, it, it's, it's a little gray. So I grew up in a financially literate household, mm. but I was not taught what I know today. So, oh, you know, for, for me, uh, and again, I, I, I have no relation with my, my father anymore, nor, nor do I desire to. And he was a Warren Buffett fanatic and he ran a third party administrative company. Um, so like creating retirement plans for businesses administratively. And then my mom was a teacher and then she, her parents um, were, her dad was a, my grandpa was a chemical engineer and then my grandma was um, an administrator. So like really well-rounded in, in that regard, but how everything started, it's kind of weird. I, so at the time, okay, Starbucks was exploding and mm. also I'm in Washington state. So like on Starbucks's doorstep. So I remember my mom had coffee and she said, don't touch it. Don't taste it. Don't, don't do anything. And I loved the smell. Well, she goes around the corner. Of course I take a sip. I get in trouble. And then after I'm done being ridiculed, I was just hooked. I was absolutely hooked to the idea of, of being involved with coffee. I, again, stocks had not come into my vocabulary at all, but I remember saying, I want to be part of this. And I, I believe it was my father that said, you know, you could actually own this business. And I thought like right now I have a sparkling water, which was probably a bad call. Cause like now I'm like burping on your, on your show, which my bad, <laughs> but like, I thought this, me holding this, this cup or, or this, this, uh, uh container I'm own, this is ownership. And mm. obviously it's not the case. And so that's when for my 10th birthday, I was gifted the intelligent investor by Ben Graham. Now, if your mm. listeners are not aware, that was Warren Buffett's teacher. And he taught Warren Buffett everything he knew. Now, conveniently, that year, Jason Zwieg, who's a financial analyst, basically rewrote the book so that after every chapter, he basically translated, okay, this is what he would have meant today. Because Graham died Whoa. like years ago. And that's when the wheels started Wait. turning. And I only probably picked up half of a percent of, of the entire book, but that half a percent is what really started the compounding track to get me where I'm at today. Wow. So timetable here or yes. timeline, I should say, when did you read that book or was that a little after you received the gift and the investment and you kind of like starting to get a taste or who planted mm -hmm. that seed and who gave you, who gifted you that? Cause I think by the way, I'm, I'm about to be, I don't know, man. I, I don't have, I don't have a child yet, but I'm about to be on some thinking grow rich, some intelligent investor. Like they're going to get yes. it all. They're still going to have a childhood, but I'm like, I like the idea of giving assets, right? Yes. And not liabilities. Yes. So who planted that seed? Cause I love that seed. So, well, and I'll tell you, so when you have some kiddos someday, if you mm -hmm. decide to have kiddos mm -hmm. and you call me and go, what are the books? I would never recommend the books in the order of which I read them. Mm. Does that make sense? Like I, I would, there are so many books I would have read before I got into investing books. Mm. And so, and I, you know what? I'm going to explain why. So, yeah, yeah. Well, so so I I was actually talking to one of my buddies about this earlier. So, you're a football fan, right? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I was just watching the playoffs. Okay, of course. So when you have the ball on offense, mm -hmm. what are you trying to do? You're trying to score a touchdown. Hundred percent. Now every team in the NFL has their own core framework. So for example, when Brady was playing, the core framework was passing the ball. When the Seahawks had Marshawn Lynch back in the day, Running. they would run it. That was their thing. Well, you can't only use that core framework. You have mm -hmm. to surround it with what I call satellite strategies. So for the Seahawks, when you had Marshawn, occasionally you would have Russell run out of the pocket and maybe just run an option. Or he'd dish one to Doug Baldwin, a deep one to lock it. 
uh, throw one over the middle of Jimmy Graham. So you've got all these satellite strategies around the core framework for the overall purpose of scoring a touchdown. Mm. Investing books are the equivalent of the satellite strategies. So if you don't have a core framework in place, the satellites are useless. Mm. Right? And that's why I wrote my book. That's why I wrote my book. That's why I wrote my book. That's why I, I created my course. Because when I left the big firms, I thought, okay, there's got to be something on the planning side of the aisle. Because mm. Ben Graham had the Bible of investing. But there wasn't anything over here. So for me, my whole thing, when I'm able to, to reverse engineer my life and go all the way back, so, and, and I can say, okay, did I become the Ben Graham of planning? Hopefully the answer will be yes. That's why I'm doing all of this. Yeah. So Chris, for someone who's listening, was like, okay, what's a, I hear the, the satellite thing. I hear the running, I hear the throwing. Are, are you saying that running is a, a fundamental framework or core framework and, and throwing is, or are you saying that it's something else? So, so basically what I'm saying is let's use another analogy, like a building. Mm -hmm. Everyone's looking at like the sexiest executive floor, mm -hmm. but you haven't even like broken ground. So for you, and until you have that foundation, you can't really get creative with like the high rise. Mm. So a lot of these people, th there is no foundation to the world of finance. And you know, what's interesting. You can get very far in the world of being personally financially successful without even truly understanding the world of investing. Like that's like yeah. personal finance 601, you know? <laughs> um, to answer your question earlier of who like sparked that though, my, my, so my grandparents set aside a couple thousand dollars for college and mm -hmm. they just gifted that. And my parents at that time allowed me to start investing that money. Oh, uh, nice. And that's how I learned. Yeah. Wow. I love that. That's, yeah. a, that's a really good. So you yeah. pick up the book and then you kind of said you wouldn't do it in that order because yes. lack of basically having a core framework, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's 2024 and I had to hesitate yeah. as I said that because it's the first month in. Yes. <laughs> do these core fundamentals change today? No. No. So one thing I tell people all the time is investments come and go, but the strategy remains the same. Mm. So with money, you know, okay. Um, I understand with real estate agents, okay? Not necessarily investing like what you're doing, right? Like that's next level, but like for real estate agents, do you have to be nimble as far as like what's going on within the world of, of real estate like investing, like just the local market for buying some, you do. But at the end of the day, it's pretty cut and dry. If someone's wanting to buy and you're this, you know, and, and you're selling it, you get the highest buyer. Mm -hmm. And then if someone, if you're looking to buy, you just keep searching and searching and searching until you like, it's, it, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. I'm again, I'm not degrading real estate agents, but the amount of uh, nimbleism you need in your mind when it comes to the financial side of things, it's, it's not cumbersome in mm. comparison to, let's say you're utilizing stocks, bonds, real estate, privately owned businesses, private credit. You need to understand interest rates. You need to understand inflation. You need to understand the tax code. You need to understand which investments would be most optimal in which accounts. Mm. And so as you start to compound all of that, what's crazy is you get to this point where you know everything is churning and then you gotta switch gears but again it's just switching investments within each different type of money and, and those that have read my book will know that so here's a very easy example uh, a money market account okay when i wrote my book interest rates were squat they were like zero mm -hmm. Okay. In 2021, when it actually, well, when I was writing it. And so I remember, cause I reread my book a little while back, which is also, here's another thing. Anyone that's written a book hates rereading their book because you just stare at it all the time. 
But every once in a while, it's a good refresher. Like, hey, what did I write? Maybe I can learn something from my past self. And I was laughing because money markets and CDs were earning like 0.05 or like maybe 0.5. Mm -hmm. So now you could buy a money market mutual fund for five, uh, five and a half, five and a quarter percent. Wow. So suddenly that type of money, which was a conservative money, actually f flows under what I would qualify or quantify as an intermediate term money, but it's still conservative investment. So you've got to be really nimble mm. with the mindset of everything. And that's yeah. how, for me, it's just a puzzle. I just shift everything it around. It really is a puzzle because... You know, there's especially especially with things that have like a negative slash positive correlation. You need to understand the two as the market shifts. You know, the economics, mm -hmm. like which is fascinating, and I think um, that's why it's so important to have people like you who understand the entire dynamics of you know the micro and the macro, right? Like, what's the big impact, right? Which I'm fascinated to still learn. Uh, I'm still learning about it. Uh, so. Okay, so you're saying the fundamentals haven't changed. Um, so then if someone's listening, they're like, okay, like I probably need to like, I probably need to, to, to get the foundation right. Yeah. Where do I start? Like, I mean, I think we hear, and again, if you're thinking about the avatar, my audience, you know, you hear about like, okay, if you're thinking of investing, people are, again, if you're not, there's a whole, there's a book here about, wealth without cash and then i won't even get to that point yeah yeah, yeah. like creative pace finance. morbies, pace morbies yeah, right absolutely yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know i think and i just want to give you some context of the paradigm because i'm all about the paradigm i think it's important paradigm is a multitude of ideas fixed in the subconscious mind which you know how you look at one thing is based on their paradigm and sometimes it's all about having a paradigm shift right so the existing paradigm might be okay i work on my credit i have a good credit I go to the bank, I get a conventional loan, et cetera. That's just a means to an end of wealth building using the real estate vehicle. We know that there are plenty, but when we just zoom out, and the reason why I'm so happy you're here is we're talking about capitalizing your finances. So if I would just forget real estate, forget buying businesses, forget like whatever T-bills, just what are the foundations that if I want to build a, 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 a skyscraper for those, for lack of better words, for our audience, mm -hmm. A multifamily building, five thousand mm -hmm. units. What are yeah. some personal financing fundamentals? I think we've gone completely. We've maybe lost sense of yeah. you know we know how to go hunting, but we don't really know if we have the right tools. And yes. so I just want to bring it back, and I'm so glad I have you that I can count on here to maybe help us steer us in the right direction. How do I reset my foundation for 2024? Hit the refresh button and start clean. What would that look like if I needed to? Yeah. So the one thing I will say that I've realized over years of doing this and interviewing some of the most successful investors in the world, what we would call super investors. And to be a super investor, you have to oversee at least a billion dollars. Okay. Which is not Damn. a small amount of money. Yeah. That's um, a lot. I'm working assets on, on assets on the management. Yeah. So I think the, as a quick side note, the, well, and it's a little tough because the hedge fund managers I've, I've interviewed, they don't have to report how much they oversee, but I think. Oh, really? Mm -mm. How come? Oh, there's a, is there, oh, I'm getting to the weeds of it. Yeah. I'm just, I just, love, I, love, I love this, I love this money talk. So what yeah, is. But like, so, so Robert Hegstrom, I'll tell you really quickly. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's probably, he's overseen the most money because he has a, a couple funds that he has. And I think he oversees now. And Robert, if you're listening, I'm so sorry, man, if I butcher this, but I think it's 10 billion. What's his so, name? So Robert Hagstrom. He wrote the Warren Buffett way in the Warren Buffett portfolio. He's a phenomenal guy. We're actually getting dinner um, when we fly out to the Berkshire Hathaway conference this year. Um, but he, he, yeah, he, he actually told me after he came on my show that he wished he kept things simpler for longer. And I've, I've really taken that to heart where mm. you want your finances to be boringly simple. So going back to answering your question. Yeah, the foundation. On the foundation side of things. I break actually, I break up my my book 
in, in my course into four segments. So capitalize today, capitalize tomorrow, capitalize retirement, capitalize your legacy. Well, if you don't have the pot to piss in, you don't have a legacy. And that means you can't retire and you can't really even think about tomorrow. So you've got one goal in mind. You have to capitalize for today. So, you know, a lot of people get intimidated by um, business terms. So what you make minus what you spend is what we call gap money or profit if you're in business. But mm -hmm. a lot of people get intimidated. So if that number is positive, first off, if it's negative, that's an issue. But then you just go back and you understand how to capitalize on your expenses. And I will tell you, without giving too much away in the book, when you're able to do that, you can cut out a lot of crap. Because the most, the majority of the time, people that are losing money from an expense standpoint, they're spending a lot of money they, that they don't necessarily need to spend in the first place. Okay? Mm. So let's assume that that's gone. And they're, they're, they have extra money. Like, what do we do? Well, a lot of people assume, oh my gosh, you just need to like rev the engine, start investing, save for retirement, all that fun stuff. Well, if you're not good for today, you won't be good for tomorrow. There's a famous investor who I'm, I'm coordinating to have on my show. His name's Monish Pabrai. He's one of the greatest investors you've probably never heard of. Yeah. And he says that when I analyze companies in my portfolio, I try to take no risk so I can take all of the risk. And for planning, it's very simple. If you've got a month's worth of expenses in your checking accounts. If you're spending four grand, money in, money out, checking, you want to have at least four. I don't care how much someone is worth, you want to have that there. Because checking, by definition, it's not going to earn you anything, okay? Mm -hmm. Once you have that, three to six months in savings, ideally an online savings account because interest mm -hmm. rates are higher, so you can earn 5% FDIC insured, okay? And then what's really cool after that, okay, if you work somewhere and they've got a, a retirement plan, if you are not putting in up to the match, you are leaving money on the table. So if someone gives you a dollar for dollar up to 4% match on your money, for every dollar you put in, they're putting a dollar up to 4%. That is a 100% rate of return. I can mm. guarantee you I have not earned 100% return on my money. I wish I had. I'm working on it. But like, it just isn't, that isn't the way. Once you have that match all set aside, then it becomes kind of, it, it gets to be a little unique. Let's say you've got a lot of debt. And let's say it's really high interest debt, like credit card debt, 27%. I don't care what you say about tax strategy, whatever, that all goes out the window. If you have debts that are higher than 6%, you need to pay those things off from highest interest rate all the way down to six. Once you get to six and below, then you take all that free cash flow that was going to those debts and you put them into your retirement plan. And until you max that thing out, don't think about going anywhere else. I can tell you some of the most successful people I've had as clients, you know, because our average client is worth a couple million bucks. Okay. I think mm -hmm. it's like three million bucks. We've had a number of people come in and they have their home, checking account, savings account, and a 401k with two million bucks in it. And that's all they did. Like they, they just made it really simple. What's the uh, age age usually of your client? So I would say our average, well, let me, let me break it down this way. So the majority of our practice, about half of our practice is from age 60 to 70, maybe a little bit higher. And then obviously there's a fat drop off after that, just based on age. I think our oldest client is 90 six 96 and our youngest is 19 um but we're getting a lot of people in their like 30s and 40s mm -hmm. and it's just because you've got a lot of these people that are doing really well and life just changes when you have half a million or more of liquidity it just does um mm -hmm. and and that's that's where you know that's our minimum for for uh, as a portfolio as far as new clients um, but frankly for me, and that actually kills me cause it's just, it's a time thing because, you know, I've, I've, I've got clients that I need to service and, you know, with, with what I have available, I'm actually doing a disservice if someone comes in and it's, I'm not saying it's more simplistic, but I almost feel guilty charging what I charge. That's why I wrote the book. That's why mm -hmm. I have the 
podcast. That's why I have the course. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you use it to get clients. No, I want people to go as far as they can without mm -hmm. calling me. Why it's do you say that? I want to help you. You know what I mean? So what, mm -hmm. Sorry, was, what was that? So what, why do you say that? I'm just curious. So 2021 was a year in the business where I kind of hit a point where I go, okay, I got a choice to make. I can either be like every other advisor, which I'm not, but in the sense of I just kind of keep building my business and right off into the sunset. But then what? I leave earth with all of God's blessings that he's gifted me. That's not a good steward of knowledge. Or I could say, all right, I heighten the minimums because frankly, like if someone like, I'll give you an example. There was someone who came in. Yes. Uh, no, a couple of days ago, uh, selling the business for three and a half million. They have four rental properties that they want to sell over the next four years. Um, they've got indemnity money coming back next year. They might set up a retirement plan to, you know, basically shelter a lot of those taxes over four years, like just crazy stuff for me. It's like, Oh man, like, like, let me work. Let me cook. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like Kobe at the top of the mm -hmm. top of the page, getting everyone out. Right. But for me, knowing what I know, it's like, okay, there's a lot of things that I can give someone where they don't have to not only pay me, they don't have to pay an advisor because a lot of these advisors out there at the small mom and pop shops or even the big houses, they do not get paid to truly plan for you. They get paid to hoard as many assets as possible. And that sucks. Mm. And they sell off of emotion, which is BS. It's mm. first class BS. In fact, in my book, I actually broke down. There's a study on why it is statistically one of the worst things to do for someone. And so that's why I do that with the book and the course. And when we do speaking engagements in the podcast, I think it's cool. You know, a lot of people like to go on boards and serve on nonprofits or whatever. That's kind of my nonprofit. But unlike a lot of nonprofits where you go on these boards and nothing actually gets done, I'm still moving mountains within my nonprofit because I still have people me emailing me going, hey, Chris, I picked up your book, uh, you know, two years ago when it came out. I started capitalizing my debt, capitalizing my savings. I just started capitalizing my retirement at 35. I've got a couple hundred thousand dollars that I'm growing. Uh, I, I understand the balancing of uh, alternative investments with the market. And I just wanted to say, thank you. Hmm. They're not asking to be a client. They're just saying, dude, thank you. Nice. And that is the coolest feeling in the world. Experiment Nation, you've heard the word MTR, midterm rentals, as it is currently a hot topic and hot commodity right now, because Again, there has been an increase in short-term rental regulations, and there also has been, let's face it, a slowdown in what we were experiencing a couple years back when it comes to bookings. So with that said, short-term rental operators are looking for alternative solutions to tap into the midterm rental space. However, there is a space, there is a sub niche of Mr. Rental Insurance that I'm truly excited about that I want to share with you that the experience that we've had, the tremendous results we've been able to have, and that's the insurance midterm rental space which is very different than your traditional midterm rentals or when you think of traditionally midterm rentals, you think of travel nurses. There is a space, Mr. Rental Insurance space that we've tapped in where you need to be well connected with insurance and relocation specialists and companies and understand the right type of asset required for you to be able to help these families. What's really important that stands out the most, which you can get in what I'm about to offer you is the understanding where to be found by these insurance companies how to properly manage your calendar so that your listings are optimized so that they can find you, how to actually gain traction and build a relationship with these relocation insurance companies. I've put together an MTR insurance blueprint. That's double M T triple R insurance blueprint to cover these foundations after we've had success landing very large contracts on single family homes that literally four X what we traditionally make in long-term rentals and also gives 
us peace of mind because there's less turnover and a hundred percent occupancy because these contracts can start anywhere from 30 days to three months to eight months and range anywhere from again we've landed anywhere from eight thousand to nine thousand dollars a month in per month on a single family home property which our mortgages are typically around the 2400 range which then gives you a large spread of anywhere from four to six k net on just one property and this is why it's very hot right now but people who haven't been in the lab with individuals like myself like jesse vasquez and dr rachel gainsborough and noble crawford don't have the foundations and don't know exactly where to start and therefore this is why i'm giving you guys a blueprint the mtrr insurance blueprint go to the website experimentrealestate.com and get yourself a blueprint to completely change or at least have a plan b if you're a short-term rental operator looking to maximize your occupancy and profitability we'll see you on the other side that's fascinating so let's talk about it because i think you know a lot of us listeners are ambitious to get there anyway so mm -hmm. let's say we want to work with you um yeah. and we're yeah. positioning ourselves for it so I, I like the context of kind of you know who it is that you're serving etc um is there what's what's a common kind of when you look across the board with things that go well mm -hmm. versus things that don't go well with someone's call it their portfolio their yeah. financial positioning what are some things that you look at and you're like oh man <sighs> just you just shake your head like ah, you know is there something that sticks out to you that that you would tell your client like hey listen Ruben I got to put you on the side man like well this is probably coming from a previous paradigm here's what I want you to consider doing or is it kind of all over the place I'm just curious are there some some common denominators that can yeah, come up there there definitely are so I think it depends on where you're at so I'm going to break so there's there's basically three types of people when it comes to retirement so mm -hmm. there's us who's accumulating and growing our net worth. Mm -hmm. There's people in what I call the hump phase where you haven't retired yet, but like you're not taking your foot off the gas. And mm -hmm. then there's the people that are decumulating their assets, which is retirement. So for people in you, your, like our demographic, it depends on the portfolio. So let's say that someone has a stock portfolio. They're intimidated by real estate, hypothetically. They, they just want to keep it simple. Um, I can still get the plan to work. Great. Well, let's say that they're looking on TV and they're like, Hey, you know, our portfolio didn't beat the market this year. Hmm. Okay. Well, that doesn't mean that it's bad. Hmm. Sometimes you have to wait years for a business to actually break even. So one of the first investments I, I, I bought just as a fun little side note was Microsoft. And people think, are, oh my gosh, you're such a genius. I looked like an idiot for over a decade because it didn't do squat. It literally <laughs> stayed flat other than it kept increasing its dividend, increasing its dividend. The underlying company was doing phenomenal, but it what the stock wasn't moving. Now, I was just oozing out of my spanks with excitement, but a lot of people were like, you're an idiot for doing that, right? And so a lot of people just read the surface level they don't actually dive into understanding what's going on within the business, which is what I get paid to do. But people say that, but then they just react emotionally because most people, you know, they're, they're, they're not wanting to get profound. Mm. They just want the quick fix. And then God forbid you utilize real estate investment trusts and private equity, which doesn't correlate or private credit. Now, those that understand it, Love it. I mean, statistically, it's the number one way to grow your net worth. But then, you know, as 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 another note to that, it's it's not necessarily when the market's just absolutely skyrocketing, but it's when things start to pull back and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, we're not getting killed. Well, let's think about it. So I'll give you an easy example. 2022 mm -hmm. business exploded for us. And I'll tell you why. Did the market take a hit? It did. Okay. Our portfolio didn't do as bad. Not even close, but it was down. Okay. 
Did real estate take a hit? You know this. No, real estate took mm. off. Did yep. private credit do well? Guess what? It did exactly what it needs to. Did private equity do well? Yeah, all in all, it, it, it did. It actually did really well. So if a client has a portfolio like that and they look and they're like, so the market's down 20, but we're up like a lot. How did you do that? Maybe it's the framework. I don't know. You know, it's like, but then in 2023, people expect everything to climb back. I'll, a lot of people don't understand this. I actually don't look at benchmarks when it comes to like, how did I do against the S&P? I don't care. The S&P 500 is 500 of the top companies in the United States. Well, guess what? Just because they're the top 500 doesn't mean I want to invest in them. I don't know what all 500 are doing versus if I've only got a couple businesses, like eight, like I have eight stocks. I know every single one of them, like the back of my hand. Now, guess what? One of them hasn't done so hot over two years. I keep buying more. <laughs> Why not? If it's good at this price, it better be even better at this price, but mm -hmm. it's a psychology shift. So that's where people are accumulating their money. And for me, sometimes I'm like, bro, I have told you this for like five years. Like, you know, that you know better, but in years like 2022, it's like the calmest thing ever because they, they're, then they're suddenly thankful. Um, when, when someone's about to retire or they have retired, people need to understand the psychology of money shifts immediately. So right mm. now, our goal is to grow our net worth, period. No questions asked. Yep. When you get to the point where you're about to retire or you have retired, the main goal is no longer that. Your main goal is to maintain the standard of living that you need with the portfolio that you have acquired as and accumulated as well as social security or pension if you're one of the few that still has them. Secondarily, anything that is left over, you can quote unquote risk for the long haul. And that's where the framework, the money really, you know, that's where we make the real money for people. So my biggest thing is like 2023. We had a client that was like, hey, you know, because they, they you, you have to separate different types of money. You cannot just bunch it all into one, uh, basically pile and assume that it all works in tandem. Can you elaborate on that? I think that's important. Yeah, I totally can. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical. So let's say that someone's about to retire and they've got a million dollars. I'm just using this for easy numbers. Okay. So they've got uh, lifetime income which in, mm -hmm. is, is, is guaranteed income, like an annuity, okay? It's not designed as an investment. It is designed as a pension. Mm -hmm. So by definition, when you allocate it with your stocks and your real estate and all that, it will drag the portfolio down. But you need to separate those. Like those are different boxes of money, which is what I talk about. Money is nimble. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, they just look at it and they add it all together. I'm like, no, that's not the case. And so, you know, we have a client that said, hey, you know, you earned, I don't know, five and a half percent or whatever the case may be last year, but my money market account was earning that and I didn't have to pay anything. I'm like, bro, that is so wrong because the way that we've allocated everything, you have to allocate every dollar relative to the unit of risk you're willing to take in the period of time mm. that you need to take it. And that's a total mindset shift versus yep. you and mine just growing your net worth as much as you can over time. And so it's just, it's hard to wrap people's minds around it. In fact, I'm probably going to write an episode about it because it comes up so much where I'm just like, guys, <laughs> what, you're, you're complaining over nothing. Like prime example. So these, these people... Um, and I love them to death. By the time they turn on social security and their annuities, statistically speaking, they will not have to worry about another dollar in their life. Everything else is bonus. Mm. Everything else is bonus. But last year had the year end. I'm like, this is going to be an easy, like, this is, this is cake. Like 
you could hire a bozo if you were tired with me and I know you're going to be good. And they were just up in arms because they're like, why didn't we outperform? I'm like, that's not, that's not right. Like, like, <laughs> let me tell you why you are wrong. And, you know, a lot of people are like, you talk to your clients like that. And I'm like, I, I know my clients. Like, I've known these people for like seven years to the point where they know if they've screwed up, I'm going to call them out. And they're pit bulls. And if you don't call out a pit bull, you're going to get turned, you're going to get torn to shreds. Mm. Like, I know the audience. But like once you know the people that you're working with, of course you you talk accordingly. But for me, it's like, yeah, you know, why hide behind a facade that you're not? Mm. You gotta call people out on their crap every once in a while. And if they don't like it, then you know, so be it. I would much rather them not like what I have to say and they know that I'm 100 percent honest than make them feel good and I know I'm hurting them in the long run. Oh, 100 percent Yeah. Hundred percent. What do you so <clears throat> with the clients that you work with? Are you seeing anything with? Do you work with folks who who own real estate or a, a, a mm -hmm. good chunk of it? Mm -hmm. um, how do oh, yeah. they, you know, bucket their money? Because you know, a lot of us again, we see the lens of real estate, so we see that kind of as our retirement strategy, uh, yeah. etc. What would you say to someone who see things that way? You know, they you heavily rely on real estate. That's what they know. What yes. what hindsight would you give them that hey like well that's true also factor this in or oh keep doing what you're doing and i've seen my clients who have had success do the following with their real estate what what would you give let's say i like the 30 year old because it's selfishly eh, i don't know a few 30 year olds around you know <laughs> yeah yeah here. so so here's my thing I'll, I'll first say full disclosure i am not against real estate and in fact mm -hmm. i would say for my wife and our portfolio I'm going to say right now we have about 38 ish percent allocated to real estate. So by no means am I against it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the recent investments that we have made have not been real estate focused. They've been business focused. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you a quick little story as to why. 2017, long story short, just because I know we're constricted on time, I uh, I basically discovered the endowment model, the number one way to grow one's net worth, statistically speaking. And, endowment, you say? Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. Dr. David Swenson out of Yale created mm -hmm. this idea of utilizing uh, all these alternative ways of, of growing their net, one's net worth, and it was called the endowment model, and mm -hmm. he has beaten the market or well, he's passed away, passed away of cancer in 2021, but he beat the market for, I think, 30 years. I think he doubled it over that period of time, which is not, that's not insignificant. Okay. And so, you know, maybe off, uh, you know, off camera, I'll, I'll get into all that, or maybe I can come back. I mean, it is what it is, but, but for me, the long story of it was, okay, all of these advisors are just providing stocks and bonds. I just got done with, you know, uh, serving clients in UBS and Morgan Stanley, the two largest institutions in the world. And that's mm -hmm. all they did. And so for me, my Swiss army knife was, I need to provide people something that they don't have. And mm -hmm. I need to have academic research behind it. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started discovering the value of real estate, private equity, lending. But it was really real estate that, that propelled the business. I can tell you 2022 came around and I read this amazing book called Where the Money Is by Adam Cecil, who's also mm. been on my show. Um, and Adam's book, there was a chart and it stuck out like a sore thumb. And it showed a hundred years what the growth rate of inflation was, the growth rate of real estate was, and then the growth rate of the top successful businesses in the country. Mm. And I'm like, whoa, okay, that makes total sense. Like the wheels were turning. Like I'm going to use you as an example. Have you made your money off of real estate or have you made your money off of the real estate business? I would make an argument real that estate it's business. real estate business, right? 100%. Now you own a ton of real estate, right? I get that. 
but it was the business that moved your needle. And Mm. so for me, what I tell people is the number one way to grow your net worth is going to be through businesses because it's the only type of asset out there that you can, uh, how should I say this? 1000% 1000% control. I'm not saying you can't control real estate. You can make it pretty. You can spruce it up from the inside out, location, all that. But at the end of the day, you are as valuable as a lot of things that you can't control. Interest rates, other homes, other properties, just the location in general, the zip code versus a business. I know you. I know you very well. You can go anywhere and build mm. a brand. And that revenue growth, that compounding growth is going to be any type of real estate that you and your wife buy. I just know that about you. And that's a compliment to you. So, you you know, I I tell people with real estate, again, I am not against it. But the thing that I have an issue with real estate is it's so prevalent because it's such an easy sell. Because it's right in front of your face. You can look, you can touch, you can taste it, you can smell it, right? You can hear it. You Mm -hmm. Like all the senses. With buying businesses, stocks, businesses, you got to do a lot more work. And you got to be a a financial detective, right? Mm -hmm. So like if I'm looking at something, I'll give you an example. Um, I learned this from the book and you're going to get this too. So with real estate you get to depreciate it over time, right? Yep. Okay. So if you bought a factory for a million dollars, you're not writing the whole thing off in one year. You could, but you're not. Most people, they write it off over 40 years. So a lot of these newer companies that I've been analyzing for myself and clients with technology, they don't have any of that. And so Mm. what I discovered was according to the tax code, which is flawed, All of their major assets are in research and development and marketing. Well, unlike a piece of real estate, you don't depreciate. You have to take all of that expense in one year. So these companies we've been looking at for the last four or five years, they've been losing money. So what I learned through the book was you need to treat those line items like a depreciating asset. Mm. You take that and you account for it and you actually depreciate it. And again, I'm getting a little nerdy. So sorry if I'm no, this is, this is very interesting. And so when you actually back that out and there's an art to it. And so for me, I like to depreciate research and development and marketing anywhere between five to 10 years. So when you do that, you go, Whoa, these companies are fine. Like actually massively profitable. And I have all the investor relations for these companies. And ask them like, hey, is this how you do accounting? I'm not going to name the company just due to the fact that it is part of our portfolio. And this guy probably got fired. But he said on the call, how do you know that's how we do internal accounting? I'm like, I don't. I'm just, I'm doing diligence, man. And so, you know, with businesses, you got to do a lot of work. And I'm not saying that you don't do a lot of work with real estate because you totally do. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is pretty much in your face with, with businesses you got to read the fine print, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's turning over those rocks. That's where you find the absolutely golden gems. Hmm. Dude, full circle. Cause you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, people are familiar with the cost segregation and all that, but mm-hmm. you know, you're applying that same and you're, you're almost saying that the number is skewed if mm-hmm. you don't know what you're doing, uh-huh. yeah. which um, I think that, that's accurate for a lot of uh, verticals because I think real estate is used very loosely at times because there's so many different models within real estate. Uh, yeah. uh, and so I think it's important for you to understand uh, to your point, all, all the angles. I always say there's always uh, multiple different perspectives of the same reality and, but there's only one truth and mm-hmm. it's in your best interest to be as educated as possible because you might look something from one angle. It might look like something else to somebody who looks at it from a different angle. Uh, and that's why we have individuals like you in the lab to help us see all of our blind spots for that yeah. is because uh, that's key. Thanks for sharing that. That's actually a really interesting one. I isn't that ever crazy? It's fascinating. But then, but then you got you to gotta actually step back and go, okay, does this model actually work? So for example, 
um, one of my early investments and actually my all time best and favorite investment was Wrigley's chewing gum. Yeah. He told me that. Right. So that business, you couldn't use that framework versus like a, you know, a technology company because it's an older company, right? Mm -hmm. So they actually bought factories, they bought cars, they had tangible assets that they could truly depreciate. So then you're asking yourself, oh, do I actually have to reaccount? And the answer is no. I wanted to actually ask you a question. So when you have like a piece of real estate as an investment for a portfolio, mm -hmm. do you have a checklist? Like, do you have an active checklist that you go through or have you done it enough where you just- By, kind of We have a buy box. We have okay. a criteria box of, you know, type of bedrooms, type of square footage, type of home, uh, because, and we know the zip codes, uh, but we also have a, a very unique model that's baked on top of the real estate. But we also run our worst case scenario, yeah, average scenario, and then best case scenario uh, to then be able to say, okay, because we don't really bank on like the whole appreciation thing. We're like we're we're saying, can this cash flow today? Yeah, with the numbers that we know. That's alternatives right? one hundred and one, man. When it comes to real estate, I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But why do you ask? Yeah, we do have a we do have a criteria. We have a it's, we call it a buy box. So the <clears> reason <throat> why I ask, and I'm glad you said that. Um, so this really opened my eyes. Oh man, probably three years ago. Uh, that great investor Monish Pabrai was on a podcast and he talked mm -hmm. about this book and I for, now I'm blanking on the book, but it's a, it's a medical book mm. and it's this neurosurgeon. Oh, it's the, uh, uh, I think it's called like the checklist manifesto. Okay. Mm. So this neurosurgeon was, uh, you know, obviously in a very risky business. Okay. <laughs> you know, he's gotten people's brains. And so, he was getting extremely anxious because, and I haven't finished the book yet, but I've read enough to know what I need to know and I am going to finish it, but there wasn't a checklist of, of to do's for him before he went into surgery. Like they teach you all the things in school, but, but there wasn't like, it wasn't a framework. So when it comes to the checklist, Monish was saying that he started a checklist for his investments. Mm. And I remember the interviewer asked, how many questions do you have? You know, is it like 12, 13? Because Phil mm. Fisher, who was a famous investor, he had 15 questions he always asked. And uh, Monish goes, I think I'm up to 174. <gasps> and so no a lot way. of people have that. A lot of people have that reaction. For me, I'm sitting here listening to the podcast. I rewound, I, I rewound it to listen to it again, just to make sure I heard that clearly. And I am a shameless cloner, which is exactly what he is. Like, I'd like to think I don't have a ton of original ideas. Like, I just I take the best of what people do and, and I try to implement it into my life. So for me, I'm like, dude, I need to start building my checklist. And so I don't have as many because I haven't done it as long as him. I think I've got now up to 112. But if I get to 111 and it's a no, I'm out. I don't even, it's no, there's no question. Because for me, I'm still human. Contrary to popular belief, I'm still human. No different than you're still human. And I see a lot of these people, they don't have a checklist on things. And, you know, you, you, You've done it long enough where you've got side questions you can ask that probably aren't on the the the, the checklist of yours, but you mm -hmm. just know, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, I think that's like subconscious comp uh, unconscious competence. I think is the word. Yeah. Like, it's like if, can can you really define what allows you to be successful in choosing the right investments? And some people either know or they don't know, or they don't right. they don't consciously know, but subconsciously say they do know because they're going through the checklist. But it's good to define it consciously. Yeah. Well, and for me, yeah. the, the questions I'm adding right now, I'm reading up on, um, and all of my buddies have told me, dude, you've got to read Howard Mark's book. I'm like, guys, I, <laughs> I have a one-year-old at home. Like I, I'm, I'm burnt out from reading right now. Like I just need to focus on my business and, and my show and, and, but I'm starting to get back into it. And what's the book? Know, um, it's Howard Marks's book. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's the, oh, I think it's called the most important thing. And, and, and it's a play on words because every chapter is the most important thing. <laughs> and Howard Marks is an amazing investor. I would say he's on the Mount Rushmore of investing, right? Like wow. he's right up there with Warren Buffett um, and, and, and Charlie Munger and all that. Oh, wow. And his questions have gotten me to think about um, like the blind spots. So one of the, my most recent questions I asked is, I now ask myself is, what do I see that seemingly no one else does? And then what am I missing that others are alleging that they are saying? Mm. About again. And then it's kind of cool because for me, it's, it's like, it's much more than just, am I going to cash flow? It's okay, qualifiably, what am I... What am I missing? Because at the end of the day, what do the most successful investors have in common? It's not that they hit the next Amazon or the next Google or whatever the case is. They understand the quality of the business, the quality of the people running the businesses, the quality mm. of the industry. It's all about the quality. Mm. And that's what I'm starting to discover with Howard Marks on the, the true subconscious in psychology of money. Cause a lot of people are like, Oh, you just, you know, invest people's money for planning. I'm like, no, no, that is so wrong. And it's surface level. And you don't know that it's wrong until it's too late. Oof. Oof. Well, listen, um, it would certainly not, ever too late to have you because the more time we wait, the smarter that you get, the more insights <laughs> that you have. Uh, so I'm so glad I had you here. Uh, you know, not always there when you call, but always on time, brother, always on time. So always. Uh, I want to thank you for coming into the lab. What is, what is, what is next for you? Like it, it, it's so good because it, it's fascinating because a lot of what you talked about is coming from a place of service, right? But for you, right? You know, I want to give you some time to think about. Okay, where do you want to take the capitalized brand next? You know, you talked about the next book. You talked about, you know, offline. Talk about some of the goals you want to do. But what is it that we can be on the lookout for, uh, for you to to see what your next experiments are? Yeah. So, you know, I would say the next experiment I have coming out. So, first off, on the podcast, we've got some amazing. We've got some amazing guests lined up mm -hmm. um, as far as what I've got personally in store. My second book comes out later this year, uh, Capitalize Your Sales. Nice. And unlike Capitalize Your Finances, Capitalize Your Sales, I, I've always had a passion for sales. And, you know, for me, um, you know, the big thing with that is unlike Capitalize Your Finances, where it's very, very technical. Uh -huh. My thing is, I just want to make sure that people know how to provide genuine salesmanship. Because frankly, if you if you cannot sell yourself, um, that's not going to be the needle. Like, like you don't have the key needle that's going to move you. So Capitalize mm -hmm. Your Sales comes out later this year. Capitalize nice. Your Sales Masterclass comes out later this Love year. Um, and then starting in 2025 as a fun little project, my social media team and I are actually going to be calling businesses. And as a benefit, it's kind of a two-parter seminar and teaching their sales people how to capitalize on their sales. It's one thing to make a lot of money. It's another to be a steward of it. And then I turn around and teach them how to capitalize on their finances. So those are some things that'll be coming out in the next couple of years. I see you're, you're creating an entire umbrella here. I didn't know that. I love that. Yes. Cap yes. Cap capitalize yes. your finances. Yes. Well, listen, man, we can't wait to see you capitalize uh, the rest of your empire and help to help others do the same. And uh, obviously, shout out to the plug. This is a book that I have in hand, but it sounds like I'm going to have to get another one under my hands as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, Capitalize Your Finances is right here by yours truly, uh, Chris. Chris, thanks for coming in the lab, man. I mean, this was overdue. We made it happen. And um, how, how can the people, obviously, you have the podcast. So I want you to plug that. But how can, what's the best way for us to, to be in touch with you, Chris? Sure. Sure. So if you're interested in the book or the course, head on over to capitalizepodcast.com and that's where the links to both of those are as well as my show. If you are on Spotify, Apple Pod, 
or YouTube, type in Capitalize Your Finances. And then if you're wanting to connect with me personally, you can go to Instagram, type in Cap and Capitalize. You can go to LinkedIn, type in Christopher Paniotu, or you can go to Twitter, Cap and Capitalize, but really Instagram and LinkedIn are, are where we're the, the most active. And then if people have questions about just personal finance that they want me to answer, because we answer fans' questions on the show, nice. hit me up, Chris at CapitalizeYourFinances.com. Um, or if you just got a question, I, I don't, Ruben knows this, I don't bite, I hug, but I don't bite. So <laughs> hit me up and I'll, I'll do my best to answer your questions within 48 hours. He's a hugger, y'all. He's a hugger, y'all. Chris Barnioto, my brother, thanks for coming, bro. And uh, just like that experiment nation, we are out. Experiment Nation podcasting has changed the way we operate as real estate investors ourselves, and it can do the same for you. Podcasting has been the source of the master classes that we get thanks to the world class real estate investors and practitioners and specialists that come into the lab from all realms, from short term rentals to mid term rentals to real estate syndications to even software as a service owners, founders, entrepreneurs have helped enrich our experiments by giving us the education, helping us build a network, and lastly, and most importantly, a brand association to open up multiple doors for our respective businesses. If you understand the power that podcasting can have, and you know that you need one for your brand, please, you can rely on our team. Investedtalent.com is my team and the team that helps this podcast, The Real Estate Experiment, become the fruition each and every single week to educate my community build relationships on the air and continue to build our brand if you know that you need to do the same for your brand and you haven't pulled the trigger yet maybe because you don't know how our company investedtalent.com does the end to end from the time that you record to the time that it is published to even repurposing content on multiple social media platforms that's what my team can do for you simply go to investedtalent.com and book a discovery call to see how my team can help you launch your podcast